Motazitabanakusi. Welcome in to a short bonus edition of the Worst Fantasy Show. We are talking about how to trade on this short little episode. Uh, this is actually an episode that I have done before in the past, but I watched that video back and it sucked balls. In fact, the last time that I did this video, I was sick as a dog coming off a trip to the States where I got fucking heat stroke. So with a little bit of updated information, I thought it would be time to bring back the art of the fantasy football trade. <laughs> It's a pile of shit. Honestly, a lot of the times trading for in fantasy football can be one of the most fun parts, but it can also be one of the most frustrating aspects of fantasy football, especially when you're getting shitty offers all the time from other owners that you wouldn't contemplate in a millennium. So let's start with number one. Trade bad players away for good players. I mean, that seems pretty obvious. Uh, but when I say that, what I mean is a lot of times, and I'll give you an example of a Quentin Johnston. Quentin Johnston is the perfect type of player that had a bad season, projects to just kind of maybe not be a guy, but because he's only in his second year, a lot of people are counting on the bounce back season for Quentin Johnson, especially when you talk about the exodus of targets for the Los Angeles Chargers. So if you're a Quentin Johnson owner and you're looking to get out of that, now would be the time to maybe pair him with uh, some draft capital or another player and pivot into another player that is good, but perhaps a little bit undervalued. So I look at players like Tyler Lockett. I look at players like Deontay Johnson. Uh, I look at players like Terry McLaurin, uh, guys who I view as being better wide receivers or just better players overall uh, that I would be willing to pivot into. So, I mean, it seems pretty fucking obvious, but you want to trade your bad players away for good players as much as possible. A lot of times this will happen in packages uh, where you're sending things away, you know, two, three guys for one guy. Um, and, and there's all kinds of different ways to do it, but no matter what, you're going to have to deal with a lot of rejection. Look, you can't just start a slow clap at any old time. You got to wait for the right moment. But how am I going to know when it's the right moment? Oh, you'll know. You'll know by staying consistent, which is number two on this list. You need to stay consistent. You need to be able to put in the work. You need to be prepared for rejections or worse, even just being ignored and having the trade hang there for multiple days on end, even weeks on end, depending on the league. But I would say that. For myself personally, when I go into any given year, I know in my mind that 95% of the trades that I encounter, whether those are offers or received offers, probably are not going through. So 95 out of 100. If I get 100 deals, uh, trades sent to me or sent through the year, I would say 95% of those are not going to happen. And so if you go into it with that mindset, you kind of mitigate a little bit of that feeling of, oh, well, people aren't responding to me or, you know, this league isn't very active and whatever it may be. It could just be that that person doesn't want to trade. A lot of people view trading as a huge risk. Um, risk assessment also can vary wildly from player to player. And so the most you know, the, the best thing you can do is really just stay consistent and don't take it personally and just, you know, 
send offers like crazy. Generally speaking, when I go in to send my trade offers, um, I will look through the league and I'll look through all the different teams to see kind of where there are some trades that fit. And I will send three to five trades out to different owners. And I might only get one response that comes back, but then that's the one that I'll start working on and eventually be able to craft a trade with. So again, just staying consistent and, you know, putting in that work in the background because it's very easy to see that big flashy trade that pops up in the, in the group chat. And sometimes those happen willy nilly, but for the most part, um, a lot of the deals that I pull off honestly are because I kept sending offers to that manager or, you know, I sent uh, offers that were rejected and then I, I modified and reset and you can definitely hit a wall with people. It happens to me all the time, but again, I don't let that change my overall philosophy for how I stay consistent in making sure that I am always trying to maximize my trade opportunities, uh, which, you know, and, Part of staying consistent, and this leads into number three, is you got to stay steadfast on your player evaluations. So, you know, the, the art of the trade in its essence is treating players like they are on a stock market and they're going to have ups and downs. You don't want to sell your players in a down, but you also have to know when to believe in those players resurging. So just to give you kind of an example, last year, Mike Evans had dropped all the way to like eighth rounds of redrafts. If you were trying to sell Mike Evans in Dynasty last season, you probably weren't getting as much for him as you're getting this season because now he's coming off the back of yet another thousand yard season and reminding people why he is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL um, and to me a Hall of Famer. So you look at a, a a guy like that, if you had stayed, if you had always believed in Mike Evans as a dynasty owner and you said, hey, I'm not going to trade him for peanuts, I'm just going to keep him this year, then you you won that bet. Uh, Derrick Henry is another one where I felt like, you know, people tried to trade Derrick Henry at a value or, uh, you know, at a bargain because of the perceived age cliff coming around the corner. And now all of a sudden, not only do you, uh, realize like, oh, right, Derrick Henry is a potential outlier who can beat the age cliff. Now he's on the fucking Ravens and is probably going to lead the league in touchdowns. So again, knowing when to stay steadfast on your players as opposed to hitting that panic button and trading them away. Um, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey last year, another example and, you know, some of this is dynasty, but it happens in redraft too. Even I I was a victim of my own impatience last year when I traded away Najee Harris, who was dog fucking me all year, just for him to start popping off towards the end of the year and hilariously had to trade trade back for Najee uh, later in the season. So that, that was like a whole fucking thing. But even in redraft, sometimes you have to – even when things aren't working out necessarily the way that you planned right away, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, if you can see the sun on the horizon, you need to weather the storm and stay steadfast in what you truly believe in. Which can be hard because sometimes we're out here messing with our perception. So the next couple of entries on this list to me come a little bit from a psychological place as much as they come from a actual trade advice for fantasy football. And I think a lot of trading just in general really comes down to uh, the psychology of the players, which I think is very interesting. But number four is messing with perception. And what that means is I almost never send three for one deals anymore or two for three deals anymore because the perception of that other player when they receive my deal 
is going to be, well, I'm trading a stud for pieces. And that is something that a lot of people, especially nowadays, are wise to. You know, people are wise to the idea that you're trying to trade uh, depth pieces for a stud, and then you're just going to run to the waiver wire and pick up more depth pieces and just keep churning over that process. And that may have worked once upon a time. It doesn't work nowadays in every single league. So one of the things that I have done to combat this, I still send the exact same three for one deal. But when you are sending that deal, a lot of times uh, it'll ask you to drop players. And whatever those players are that you are planning to drop, I would just include them in the deal. Because now, even if the player sees those two players as junk, it's still three players for three players. And um, so the way that works, it works two ways. So let's say I'm the one sending the three players for their one player, and I'm trying to get that stud. Well, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go look on their team and their bench, and whatever two players I think that they would drop, I'm going to include in the deal to try and have come back to me. Because especially a lot of times what happens is now we have three players versus three players, like I mentioned. Of course, their stud is is going to be worth more than all three of my players. However, by including those two garbage players, now all of a sudden these two players on my side are more valuable than these two garbage-ass players that I included in the deal, right? So now all of a sudden, somehow the perception of the deal is more fair because you're winning by a large amount on these two pieces even though you're losing your stud, and I'm sending you a bunch of depth pieces at the end of the day. It's still basically the same deal. The only difference is I took your garbage, which I'll end up just dropping those players and replacing them with waivers anyways. It's still the exact same deal for me. Um, and in reverse, again, if someone's asking for my stud and they're sending me a bunch of like depth, uh, there are, I very rarely will do those deals. Almost never. I would say like 1% of the time I do those deals. But in the, in the case of when I do do those deals, again, I'm not going to just do a, a three for one or whatever. There might be players on my, on my bench that I just want to, like, if I'm just going to drop those players anyways, I will include them in the deal and I will kind of turn it around. This actually is a perfect lead in right into number five. I'll ask for a throw in is what it's called. So again, going back to this same example of we have started from a place of a three for one deal. We want us the stud coming back for the three players, or in this case, we are just desperate for any kind of depth and we're going to send our stud out to get some depth pieces. Now there's two ways of doing this. And the, the first way is, like I said, where you're grabbing their bench poo to put in the deal so that it's three for three. Okay, that's, that's the first way to do it. The second way to do it is if I am sending the stud. Okay, so this is, we are now on the reverse of, and again, I, I very rarely do these deals, but in the case of, and this is more for Dynasty, but it can apply to redraft. So again, I'm sending out the stud. I'm the one getting back the three players. I'm going to look at their bench and I'm going to see again how I can create low value for myself by asking for throw in. So, whether those are backup running backs that I perceive as having a chance to, you know, start at some point during the year. Uh, whether those are older wide receivers that I still think have spot start value, like Adam Thielen or Zay Jones. In Dynasty Leagues, whether those are low end draft picks, like uh, third and fourth round draft picks. Um, you know, if I'm sending you three players, uh, or sorry, if, if I'm sending you a stud and you're sending me three players, I might say, well, look, you, we both know that those are like depth players. Let me include a couple depth pieces on my side 
So I throw in a couple guys to make it again a three for three. And I say, but I want your third round draft pick, or I want your fourth round draft pick. So now it's three for three and uh, a pick, right? Just changing the deal slightly. And you want to stay steadfast. You want to ask for those. You don't want these to be deal breakers, though, right? These are not things that are, like, at the end of the day, going to stop the deal from happening. If, for some reason, that person decides, uh, oh, well, you know, I really can't give up that that third-round draft pick. Well, how about a fourth? I, even that is, a, okay, fine. That's fine. I'm, I might still do the deal depending as for me, especially if I'm getting the stud, I'm always doing that deal. In my mind, I just want the best player in the deal. That's how I win that trade. But again, there's different ways of going about it, different ways to skin a cat. It's just making sure that you are always asking for throw-ins and as much value as you can extract from that trade. So again, even if that is perceived as bench players, you can still utilize those and they come through more often than not, especially in like deeper rosters or in dynasty leagues. Uh, So, and again, talk about a lead and it's a perfect lead into uh, my other, one of my favorite types of trades that kind of get ignored is low level deals. Hey, y'all pick My mother makes me eat them. I'm crazy about them. I'll say you mark it for a nickel. How about two cents? Okay. I have two pickles. I have two pickles. I have two pickles today. Hey, hey. So low-level deals are basically, you know, almost irrelevant players, but they're often like depth pieces that fit your rosters. And those trades should not be ignored because they can be extremely helpful for you, especially in deep dynasty leagues. So just as like an example, Hunter Henry for Ty Chandler would be a perfect example of like a low level deal where let's say you're in a league where you really need a tight end. You're in a tight end premium league. It's a deep league. There's not any tight ends that you can acquire on waivers or anything. Your tight end rooms looking kind of, kind of makeshift and and suspect. And so you're just looking for a potential starter, a low-level guy. Hunter Henry is a perfect kind of target. And let's just say he's on the team that that has Aaron Jones. You happen to have Ty Chandler. That's an easy, low-level deal that you can go to that manager and say, hey, let me give you your handcuff running back and let me get Hunter Henry because I need an extra tight end. That's a deal that works for both teams, especially if they have tight end, other tight ends, um, and they don't feel like they're really losing anything with Hunter Henry. If they're really like, you know, moaning about it, you could even throw in a fourth or a third to try and grease those wheels. But again, those are like low level deals. A lot of times people, I think, focus only on like the big name trades where it's like first round draft picks involved and all that kind of stuff. But these deals I will end up doing more often. And I obviously like, you know, when you make the big stud trade, that's great and everything. And that helps your team the most. But these deals, I feel like through the year, if you can complete 10 to 15 low level deals to really just improve your roster over the year. I, I think that is a viable way, especially in Dynasty. I feel like it gets super overlooked of how to improve your team without having to rely on, you know, doing the full rebuild, for example. Um, but these last ones uh, are basically all about, you know, psychology and kind of a, what to avoid in trades. So the the first thing is and this is uh we're at this point where i've lost track of like what the numbered list is let's just say that uh what is this number seven fuck it who cares what i want to say here is when you are sending out your initial offer you should always have the offer in your mind that you want and then ask for a little bit more ask for just a little bit more than you actually want you're like why why would i be selfish like that jack because when you counter 
Now you're countering to the deal that you actually wanted all along. So uh, a perfect example is let's say I'm targeting the wide receiver two of a team or a wide receiver three on that team. What I actually will do a lot of times is I will send a trade for their wide receiver one. Uh, So let's just to use some actual concrete names. Let's say I'm trying to get Terry McLaurin off a team that has pretty good wide receiver depth. Let's say they also have AJ Brown and DK Metcalf. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send an offer for AJ Brown. If for some reason they're willing to talk to me even about AJ Brown, fucking A, let's do that. But let's say they're like, no, AJ Brown's off the table, but I could trade DK Metcalf for Terry McLaurin. Oh, could you now? Perfect. Here's a deal for Terry McLaurin, which was the original deal that I wanted to send in my brain. And now, part of the thing too is. Again, the psychology of that other person, you're putting that other person in a spot where instead of this being the uh, initial departing point of the deal, where they are coming back the first time to say, well, you know, I want more for Terry McLaurin kind of thing. They have already compromised and told you no on A.J. Brown. They have already come down in a sense in value in their mind and perception by now trading this other wide receiver for them to continue to say, Oh, I need more. I need more. It be, you're almost creating the point of, they start to question of themselves. Am I being selfish? Am I asking for too much? And, you know, so that's where I'm saying, like, again, you can, let's say I'm trying to trade in a dynasty league, Tyler Lockett and a second round pick for Terry McLaurin. What I, like I said, what I'll do is I'll put Tyler Lockett and another player in my first round pick, and I'll ask for AJ Brown and garbage. And and if they say yes, fucking A. But let's say they're like, no, I, I don't really like that. Ba, ba, ba. Okay, fine. I come back with Tyler Lockett and a second for Terry McLaurin. Boom. Deal done. That's that's exactly because they might have come back. If I had only just sent the first one of hey, let me give you uh, Tyler Lockett, my second for Terry McLaurin. They might be like, oh, I need a first. I need, I at least need a first. And they might still say that, and I might have to make that decision. But there is a chance that, again, by getting them to compromise, by coming down from the initial deal, which was a deal that I was shooting for the stars, it's like when you shoot for the stars, you land on the moon. It's that old verbiage and adage. So again, asking just a little bit more than what you actually want in the trade. But you're going to run into the used car salesman guys. Uh, No matter what, they exist in every league, in every format. There are uh, variations, uh, levels to the used car salesman. Uh, Just don't be that guy. See this junker? I paid $100 for her. She's got 120,000 miles on her. Transmission shot, bumpers have fallen off. What do I do with her? Hmm? I sell her. There, I'm thinking of a guy in particular. I'm going to call him out. I don't even care. Tyler Bradley. I love you, my man. Shout out to you. Uh, runs the Fantasy Football Advice Network. Never in my life have I seen uh, a guy who the used cars salesman personality comes out more in trade talks uh, to the point that like, I kind of actively avoid uh, negotiating with him. Like if he uh, basically, if he'll send me an offer, I might look it over, but I've gotten to the point where I just don't even bother sending him offers anymore because the, the way that we perceive the values are so far apart that there is no middle ground and that can happen and that's fine. And there might be people in your leagues. Now, if you're playing with 11 of those people, maybe you just need to find a new fantasy football league to play in. doesn't mean you have to leave that league. Maybe just add some more to the portfolio. Uh, But yeah, you don't want to be that guy, but also it's really hard to interact and trade with that guy. I feel like a lot of times I, it happens every year, though, because they are usually very diligent. And those are the type of managers I love to compete against, but they're not the ones that I'm wanting to trade with. Because um, me, in my mind, too, I think 
guys like that and uh you know managers like that i shouldn't say guys managers like that in general have kind of a perception that trades should be a hundred percent risk adverse meaning you shouldn't be making any kind of risky trades and i am the complete opposite of the spectrum i think trades are all about taking risk and that the best trades in fact are often the riskiest ones that end up paying off. Uh, so again, when I say that, I mean like, you know, a perfect example of one that drove people fucking bonkers last year was in a redraft. I've traded away Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase for uh, Josh Allen and Drake London. I probably could have got back more, probably could have got back a better receiver. You know what? Josh Allen by himself pretty much outscored uh Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase when you count like the missed games that Burrow had and the down games that Chase had because he had fucking Jake Browning under center and shit like when you combine when you tallied it all up even with Drake London's struggles like I won that trade purely on the amount of fantasy points that Josh Allen and Drake London got for my teams during that 8 week span as compared to Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase I made a little, I didn't make the playoffs, but the only chance I even had at making the playoffs was because I made that trade. It was a very risky trade, but technically it paid off for me. So I don't think trading should be 100% risk averse. And by the way, don't ever fucking do that. Uh, I would never recommend it. That's the type of trade that like I will make myself because I'm fine taking huge risks. And seeing how it works out, especially in that league, like I said, it was a free redraft. I wanted to experiment a little, but you should never fucking do that. I would never recommend that to anyone. And that leads into my final point of the day so that we can wrap this up before we hit 30 minutes. Do not trade just to trade. Do not draft to trade. That's another thing I fucking hate. Don't be the guy that drafts all the handcuff running backs or fucking three quarterbacks or whatever because you think that you're going to be able to trade them in the season. It's just a bad strategy drafting to trade, but also trading to trade. Don't trade just because you're bored or you know trading just because you want to get that big deal on the board or whatever. Every trade that you make, even the risky ones, in theory, should be in the objective of improving your fantasy football team. That's it for me. We'll wrap it up here for the trades. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, you can always hit me up uh, at Jack Lucena on all my socials. I would love it if you guys could send some questions, ideas for the show, things you want to see on the show. Um, hit me up again at Jack Lucena on my socials, or you can always send emails to worse sports channel at gmail.com. But until the next time, I'll catch all you guys on the flip side.